Thank you. Good morning, and thank you so much for inviting me to this uh, workshop. All right, water in the upper mantle today. And first, what do I mean by water? Because I use this word as a, in a very large sense. And actually, my, what I'm really going to talk about is hydrogen dissolved in uh, various forms in all the phases of uh, the mantle. So where do you find, uh, why, why would I call it water? Uh, well, it's not my idea, it's just kind of a tradition. Maybe it's because when we quantify the amount of hydrogen or water, we uh, calculate it as part per million, so weight percent H2O. So maybe that's why we call it water. Okay, where do you find this water in your upper mantle? Of course, you can, uh, there you go. Uh, of course, there are melting fluids that circulates in the mantle, and water can be dissolved in that. Uh, but these are localized phases. Uh, water uh, can also be found in uh, rare hydrous minerals that you find in the mantle, parkasites, flocopite. But uh, the main reservoir of water in the upper mantle is actually the so-called nominally anhydrous minerals, that is the main phases of the mantle, like uh, olivine pyroxene, and uh, garnet. And I say the main reservoir because if you calculate how much wa water you would have in the upper mantle, if you add it to the whole upper mantle of the uh, whole earth, it would be the equivalent of several oceans in mass of water. All right, so why do we care about uh, water in the mantle? That's because a little bit of it can have a strong influence on key chemical and physical properties of the mantle. Uh, here are some of the main ones. Uh, of course, if you add a little bit of water, uh, melting will occur at lower temperatures. Water is thought to have an influence of rheolog on rheology. That is, if you add a little bit of water to olivine, it's supposed to uh, be uh, more deformable, weaker. And so this has important implication on ge geodynamic models of the Earth. I have a little asterisk here because um, there's a recent paper that came out in 2013 when they challenged this and think, uh, say that maybe uh, water in olivine does not have such a large influence on its rheology as previously thought. Anyway, I'll talk about a, a lot about this during the talk. And of course, water is important to uh, interpret in, in the interpretation of remote sensing of the deep earth. Uh, that include uh, seismic wave attenuation, electrical, and thermal conductivity. Uh, so what I want to do in this talk is uh, use real mantle, uh, I mean natural uh, peridotite, upper mantle rocks, and uh, measure the water content in them and try to map the distribution of water in the upper mantle, and also understand what controls the range of water contents that we observe in oceanic and uh, continental uh, settings. So we'll start with the, well, okay, first, what type of samples do I work with? Well, I work with peridotites and I work a lot with mental xenoliths, which are a little chunk of mantle that some lavas pick up uh, on their way up through the mantle and bring us uh, pretty much intact to the surface. These lavas typ are typically alkali magmas, and uh, if you go to cratonic settings, it's more like kimberlites. Okay, skip that. Uh, I want to address first uh, a little problem we have sometimes with this type of data is that uh, by the time the piece of mantle here is picked up by the lava and brought up to the surface, sometimes the hydrogen uh, will diffuse out of the minerals. And that is a problem because then if we measure uh, water in the middle of an olivine like this, and uh, some of it has, is gone, this water content that we'll measure will not represent what it was in the mantle, which is what we are interested in uh, in this talk. So I don't have to go through all this, but what I want to tell you here is that I have filtered the, the, all the data that we have on water in the mantle to only include the ones that I really think are uh, mantle values and the ones that I, th I think I've lost water, I have uh, excluded. Um, okay, let's start with uh, the oceanic mantle as we have talked about it this morning. Uh, what can we analyze uh, for mantle rocks in the oceanic lithosphere? Um, well, we can, um, there are lots of data on just analyzing water in uh, oceanic basalts. And uh, so that's great, we have lots of data, but 
uh, if you want to know the water content of the source, it's of course uh, re recalculated and they have a problem with potential degassing. But we actually have real mantle rocks from oceanic settings. Uh, we have abyssal peridotites, which are actually outcrops of peridotites at mid-ocean ridges. And these are great, but the problem is uh, they are very often altered by hydrothermal fluids circulating through them. So that are rare. And finally, we sometimes have uh, mantle xenoliths in oceanic island basalts. And here I want to talk about those from uh, Hawaii. All right, so uh, peridotites, uh, the main lithology of the uh, upper mantle is the result of partial melting. And um, so uh, these rocks at Hawaii uh, retain in their chemistry the signature of partial melting, like seen here, where you see a correlation between uh, bulk rock aluminum content and um, the, uh, that's kind of the amount of aluminum and chromium in spinel, and this correlates and this can be explained by melting. What do we expect water to do during melting? It's uh, hydrogen, so I will, I will use water, hydrogen, uh, kind of uh, as synonymous. But um, so hydrogen is an incompatible element, and uh, it goes. That, that means it goes into the melt during partial melting. So the higher the degree of fusion, the higher the melting, uh, we expect to uh, have less and less water in a, in a peridotite rock and its minerals. Uh, on the right, I show you the, um, the bulk rock water contents on the xenolith from uh, Hawaii here. And I want, uh, there's not really a good correlation with an index of melting here. Uh, what I want to show you here is that the range of water content, 50 to 120 ppm, is within the range of what we think the morb source uh, is, kind of the low, lower part of the range. All right, so does water correlate with indices of melting? Well, the water content of pyroxenes do, and this is what these uh, red arrows uh, show you here. So this is great, right? So we think the range of water con uh, contents observed here is due to melting. Well, not so fast. When we try to model this by just taking uh, reasonable uh, you know, sources, for example, the depleted mantle, uh, the source of morb, if you want, which so to contain about 115 ppm water, and we melt that with melting models, and this is what all these curves are. Uh, we see that all these melting curves fall, uh, fall uh, systematically below our data. What it means is there's too much water in these uh, Hawaiian peridotites to be explained simply by melting. So even if there are some correction, correlation with the pyroxene water content, melting is not what controls these uh, ranges. The other thing that typically happens to mantle rocks and peridotites is that after they are done melting, um, you have um, melts or fluids that uh, circulate through them and re-enrich them in various <coughs> elements, incompatible elements, uh, including water. And for example, uh, the, uh, some elements that are uh, typically disturbs, disturbed are, are the rarest elements, like from lanthanum to lutetium. And this is the uh, rarest element in clinopyroxene. And when you have these steep uh, patterns like this and rich in light rarest element, it's very typical of metasomatism. And uh, we see this melt rock interaction in these rocks also in the hafnium and neodymium isotopes. So could that explain our high water contents? Uh, yes, it does. So if we do a sim simple mel uh, mental melt interaction modeling, uh, we obtain these uh, dotted uh, blue and purple curves, and you see that they kind of uh, are closer in amount of water to the data. So what we think is that the water is actually brought in by uh, melts circulating through uh, the peridotites, and these melts are probably the parent melts of the Hawaiian volcanics. Okay, this is a very crude sketch. Um, of uh, Hawaii, and I'm sorry I put my plume vertical. Apparently, it's not fashionable anymore. I didn't know, sorry. Um, so anyway, um, so what it represents is kind of a cross section along the island. And our um, mental xenoliths come from the island of Oahu, so it's uh, not on the plume head. It, it actually erupted after the plume head moved away from, uh, um, from that location. Uh, the other thing that we know, and that's a study by my uh, colleague Michael Bizimis, is that uh, the xenoliths that we analyze are old. The rhenium depletion, depletion ages that we have 
uh, are from 0.4 to 2 billion years old. That's much older that, uh, than the age of the Pacific uh, Ocean lithosphere at Hawaii, which is about 100 million years old. So what we think these uh, xenoliths represent are actually chunk of all depleted recycled oceanic peridotites that are actually in the oceanic at stenosphere. They are being picked up by the plume and brought uh, like this, underplating the Pacific Oceanic lithosphere. And then after the plume passed, there, there was this re so-called rejuvenated volcanism, that is the volcanism that occurred after the plume moved away from that location. So the parent melt of these rejuvenated volcanics uh, um, re enrich in water this old depleted peridotites, and that's what we have in, uh, in, uh, in our hand as phenolis. Now I want to uh, take a step back. Uh, I, this is water in the oceanic lithosphere, and this is all the data I know we have on uh, real peridotites from the ocean. So in black, it's still the Hawaiian data. And uh, the other data are from abyssal peridotites. And uh, most abyssal peridotites have less water than Hawaii, which would be consistent with, uh, mostly with uh, a simple uh, melting of a, of a depleted mantle, which is consistent also by the fact that abyssal peridotites represent the very top column of the uh, oceanic upper mantle. However, there's one location where somebody has measured high water content in autoparoxene as high as Hawaii. So as you can see, oceanic <coughs> lithosphere, we don't have enough data to make uh, big uh, uh, assumptions, and uh, it seems to be heterogeneously uh, hydrated, even if you are far away from a big plume like uh, Hawaii. So that's all I have for you for oceanic mantle. Now we're going to move to the continental mantle. And especially we're going to go to a uh, cratonic lithosphere. And this is the third time I think you see this diagram. It's very popular. So. Um, anyway, it's a good representation of what uh, the lithosphere looks like uh, under cratons, which is the oldest part of continents. What it is, it's very thick, like uh, 200 kilometers deep or more, and it's very old, several billion years old. Um, it's kind of an iceberg, if you want, of, of uh, lithosphere uh, floating on the asthenosphere. And the uh, mystery with these things is always how come this big root here, has, this, this big lithosphere, has survived over billions of, of years without being uh, delaminated from uh, below by the convecting uh, asthenosphere? <coughs> and the typical parameters that are um, invoked, if you look for internal cause to the resistance of cratonic root delamination, has always been uh, the density, because uh, the lithospheric roots of cratons uh, have lost a lot of melt and the heavy elements are left. So it's buoyant. It has low temperature. And also it always, uh, so, so this is, is known, that's a fact. And uh, also it always has been uh, hypothesized that it has low water content because uh, the water, as I said, likes to go into melt. So it's really left also, so it should be uh, dry. And uh, this is actually what we're going to look at today. I'm actually going to measure water in cratonic roots and see if it indeed it is dry or not. So for this, we're going to go to the Cap Val and the Siberia mainly. And if I have time, I'll address Colorado Plateau and uh, Tanzania. Let's start with the uh, Cap Val in southern Africa. The point of this slide is just to show you that I have a lot of different symbols for the data. And all that means is just different location locations uh, in the Caval Cratons, uh, different xenolith suites, each brought by uh, one kimberlite pipe. So don't worry too much about the symbol for Caval, really. So this is all the data. What you see here is uh, olivine, autoperoxine, clinoperoxine water content versus pressure. The peroxine water content do not change much or do not see any systematic variation with pressure. However, in olivine, we seem to see a decrease in water content at the highest depths from 5 GPA to 6.5. And our deepest uh, samples are uh, very dry. I think I have, there you go. Um, all right, so this is what, what we see uh, under the cap bar. So we have used this observation in 2010 to uh, have a hypothesis that um, um, maybe uh, cratons are the, the bottom of, of the uh, cratonic lithosphere. The olivines there are very dry, which makes them uh, very strong um, and undeformable. And this 
a strong layer at the bottom here helps cratons resisting delamination by the asthenosphere from below, in addition to the density and the temperature. And so on. All right, so this is Gracie's cap bar. So the next uh, step after this was, of course, is this uh, visible in all cratons. So we went and analyzed uh, Xenolis from the Siberian craton, and here you go. So um, first I should point out that this work was done by Luc Doucet, uh, who is now at the uh, University of Brussels. So this is olivine water content versus pressure, and the, there is very different profile in Cabal and Siberia. Mainly Siberian olivines can be very wet, uh, more than 300 ppm water, and uh, s uh, the, some of the uh, most water-rich uh, olivines are found at the deepest levels that we have access to with peridotites. It's very different from the cava, which is dry down there. This is uh, all the data set, so this olivine, pyroxene, garnet water content versus pressure, so I just uh, described uh, the olivine one. But uh, even the autoperoxines and the garnet, the most water-rich ones, are the deepest ones. All right, so what's going on? So uh, first, I want to try to understand um, what controls these wide, uh, big ranges of water content. And we're going to do like, like we did in um, Hawaii. Is this partial melting? Is it metasomatism? All right, so let's start with partial melting. So what you see is uh, olivine water content here, or bulk rock water content, versus various indices of melting. And the observation is that there is no correlation. Second. Uh, just like we had in Hawaii, uh, we have too much water in these peridotites to be explained simply by uh, melting models. That would be a, a roughly a, a melting curve here, and most of our xenoliths are too water-rich. So the range of water content observed in cratonic roots is not uh, controlled by melting. Or if it was in the past, it has been erased by other things, which is probably metasomatism. So before we look at this, um, we uh, need to understand what type of uh, rock we have here, because like I said, on the Cadva, for example, we have xenoliths from several locations, kimberlite pipes, and each kimberlite pipe will uh, sample a little region of, of the mantle, which would be com completely different from another kimberlite pipe. So each region will have a different metasomatic history, not only in terms of composition of the fluids and melts, but also on multiple, on the amount of maybe the age of the metasomatism, maybe uh, how many metasomatic events there has been. So uh, it's, it's complicated, but at least we can, what we have to do first is isolate each data set uh, and see if we have trend in each. And it's easy for Siberia because we have analyzed only uh, one uh, location in uh, Siberia, that's Udashnaya. And uh, what we have uh, is olivine water content correlates with the amount of clinopyroxene. The garnet water content correlates with uh, the titanium content of garnet. And these are a quite typical uh, in, uh, sign of uh, uh, metasomatism, even model <coughs> metasomatism that, that uh, recrystallize uh, clinopyroxene. And we see it again in the trace element. These are the rarers again, the blue ones. Uh, which are the, the one with lots of water in their olivines, have more incompatible elements than the red ones here, which have um, less uh, water. And uh, we see the same thing in a cava. Honestly, I don't have the time, but if you isolate a data set, uh, you see also that it's all controlled by metasomatism or refertilization. So we are back to this uh, initial observation. Uh, we are going to compare cava and Siberia. And so what we have, what we know now, is that the water has been brought in by melts and fluids circulating through the mantle, and uh, maybe along veins, shear zones, uh, who knows exactly how, how it is physically. And uh, we have dif very different uh, water content profiles in olivines with depths. So that means that in Siberia, water is released uh, during these uh, metasomatic events at all pressures of the cratonic root whether in uh, Capval we have release of water only at the shallowest levels. Okay, so why? Uh, I can tell you right away I don't have really an answer, but we can uh, try to uh, see if there are any differences between these two cratons. Um, 
So both cratons are old, and some rocks are more than 3 billion years old. Kimberlite, various ages, but no big difference there. Uh, both, uh, in both cratons, we have extensive evidence for metasomatism and many types of metasomatisms. Um, many many I mean, in terms of composition. Um, uh, um, uh, dating the metasomatism is, is really difficult, but we think that in the Caval, uh, metasomatic events have occurred from the Archean to the Mesozoic. Uh, I don't have the answer for Siberia. And finally, both cratons are still deep. They still have a deep root of 200 kilometers or so. So um, are there any differences? Uh, we think there is a difference in oxygen fugacity, which is just a degree of oxidation of the, the mantle. And what this diagram on top shows is just that the, uh, the uh, mantle becomes more and more reduced with depth, um, both, both in Siberia and Catval. However, when you are at the deepest level, um, Siberia here in yellow is about one log unit more oxidized than the Catval is. And why do we care about this? It's because depending on the oxidation state of the mantle, the composition of the fluids that are stable down there will be different, which is what you see with the bottom diagrams, which are the composition of the fluids versus pressure. And uh, in blue, you have the amount of water, and in uh, orange, you have the amount of methane, CH4. And because of this difference in uh, oxygen fugacity, uh, it, it turns out that there is much more methane in the fluids at the bottom of the Caval than they are at the bottom of the Siberian craton. So what that means is a, is a fluid that contains a lot of methane will have a lower uh, water activity than a fluid that contains <coughs> more water. And so the, an olivine or a mineral in equilibrium with that probably will have less water if it's uh, reduced like this than oxidized. It's a hypothesis, um, but at least it's a difference. Uh, the other big difference between uh, Caval and Siberia is this, and I have no idea if this is related to uh, water, but it's definitely something <laughs> different. Um, uh, what you see here is a, a map of the uh, seismic velocities uh, at the level of the lower mantle here and the level of the upper mantle here. And what that shows is that beneath Africa, there is a giant upwelling plume of uh, hot material that comes up uh, right beneath the Catval and then kind of goes, uh, this is a cross section uh, towards the East African Rift or something. So it's beneath Catval, but uh, I mean, it's beneath Africa, but it's definitely not beneath Siberia. Um, so I don't know if it's related, and I suppose we could, uh, we have to analyze other cratons in the world to see if there is a trend here, but uh, that's the difference between the two cratons. Uh, another question I have some people in the room later is how, how long the thing has been sitting beneath uh, Africa. Try to see if we can relate it with the Asian metasomatism or something. Okay, let's go back to uh, the role of water on the rheology of the mantle. And, uh, oh, hold it. So remember at the beginning, when we started uh, studying only the Cava, we proposed that uh, the Cava Craton was underlain by a dry, uh, contained the olivine down there was dry, so it would make it resistant to uh, delamination. However, now that we have Siberia, uh, this challenges this uh, hypothesis. So uh, we don't have an answer, but we have two scenarios. Um, either uh, the xenoliths that we have, where am I? Here. The xenoliths that we have are not representative of the whole mantle. What we have in our uh, rock collection is an overrepresentation of metasomatized mantle that are along these conduits of metasomatism here, whether they are shear zone or whatever. The overall mantle, like this uh, green thing here, is dry and we don't have that many sample of that, and that means water may still have a role in cratonic root long-term longevity. Scenario two is that oxenolis are representative of the whole mantle lithosphere, so this thing is riddled with uh, metasomatism uh, that has uh, completely transformed its chemistry uh, like this. And, uh, but in that case, in the light of the uh, data for uh, Siberia, um, you, that means the water wouldn't have no role in cratonic root long-term longevity. And in that case, maybe that paper that came out in 2013 may be right that uh, uh, water does not have a large effect uh, on uh, olivine rheology. 
And to keep with the rheology theme, now I'd like to address whether water has a role in uh, delaminating cratons, because I just, we just studied uh, two uh, cratons that still have their roots, but there are cratons that have lost theirs or part of theirs. And could that be caused by uh, water addition that would weaken the olivine and help delaminating uh, the cratonic root? And for this, uh, we can go to the Colorado Plateau, which is in the southwest uh, USA. So the Colorado Plateau is not thick anymore. It is only 120 kilometers uh, deep, so it has been delaminated from below. And there are two hypotheses uh, for this. Either it's because it sits next to the Rio Grande Rift, so maybe a pooling of hot mantle may have caused uh, the delamination, or it's because a subduction uh, uh, zone has uh, been, I mean, a subduction event has been occurring uh, beneath this region for the last 150 million years. That's the subduction of the Farallon Plate, which would have uh, brought in water and maybe helped delaminate the Colorado Plateau route. The other location we're going to go is Tanzanian Craton. So that Craton is still deep. It still has all its roots, uh, 200 kilometers or so. Uh, however, it sits right next to the East African Rift here. And on its edge, it's starting to be a little thinner. Um, and we particularly see this in the xenoliths we studied, which are uh, from uh, location here right at the edge, uh, Labate. I have no idea how to pronounce this, but I'll do Labate. And, um, so in the Tanzanian Craton, in that uh, location, you have two types of uh, xenoliths. You have some, the shallowest ones, uh, low pressure. They, have more than, they are uh, more than 2 billion years old, so they are cratonic xenoliths. And the deepest ones are young. So that means it's already replaced uh, mantle. It's not cratonic anymore. All right, so what about the water? So I should point out that uh, the Tanzanian Craton is the work of uh, Heiju Hui and the Colorado Plateau, that's the work of Zheng Shueli, and that, that was published in 2008. So i show you these data in comparison with the Caval in pink and Siberia in uh, yellow. So in Tanzania, all these xenoliths, whether it's olivine here uh, on top or the paroxene uh, water contents at the bottom, are quite dry compared to uh, Caval and Siberia, so very dry metal. Colorado, on the other hand, is quite wet, especially the paroxene are exceptionally uh, water rich, and the olivine for the pressure are quite water rich, up to 50 ppm water. So, so there you go, you have two settings where we think uh, cratonic delamination is occurring, because one is dry, one's wet. So uh, also for the uh, Colorado Plateau, we have analyzed uh, xenoliths from the Rio Grande Rift, Kilbourne Hall. That's the work of uh, our student Lillian Schaefer, and those are the great crosses. And uh, these Rio Grande Rift xenoliths are not very water rich. So probably this high water content Colorado Plateau is indeed coming from the Farron slab. And at a time, we argue that it's probably helped uh, uh, thinning the cratonic root, and it may have, uh, I don't know. However, here, if there is any thinning of the uh, Tanzanian craton on its uh, eastern uh, margin, it's certainly not uh, linked to water because it's quite dry. No, I still have time, yes, okay. Uh, now, the uh, last thing I have is just a, a comparison of global data set for water in the mantle. One minute, okay, I'll be quick. Uh, so olivine, water content, burk rock, water content versus pressure, paroxene. This is the craton data we just discussed, nothing new. Off craton, uh, they fall uh, on top of uh, the cratonic data, nothing new, nothing different. And this is the oceanic uh, water content that we discussed earlier. So the, the point here is that everything is with, uh, for the burk rock, for example, is within between 10 and uh, 150 ppm typically. So it's very similar to uh, what is thought to be the more source in terms of water content. There is no uh, big difference between cratons, of cratons, the oceanic type of mantle in terms of water. And um, conclusions, pretty much what I said, uh, not enough data for the oceanic lithosphere. Cratonic lithosphere, water is, con uh, is controlled by metasomatism and oxygen fugacity. Uh, water content is pretty much similar in continental oceanic lithosphere, and there are a few extremes that we have discussed. And the fact that we don't have really a correlation between deep cratonic root and dry and thin 
protonic roots and wet. We don't see that, it seems. Maybe challenges the assumption that water has a uh, important role in the stabilization and destruction of cratons. And that's all I got there. You can uh, know more at AGU if you go. <laughs> Thank you.